Okay, so I promise you, I'm going to stop in time for questions this time. Okay, I promise. But, not yet. Um, okay, so previous hour we talked about what intersectionality was, how it has become a bit of a, uh, has become a political theology in many ways, how it's been countered by a, a competing political theology. Um, now I wanna talk about where are we headed and why things are going to only get more extreme, okay? So you guys right now are in a little bit of an interesting environment um, in that you're a, a collection of evangelicals in a pretty blue area. Um, Louisville's pretty blue. Um, that's kind of, that makes you kind of not the norm. Um, here is the norm in the United States of America. You guys may have heard this term, it's called the big sort. Um, and the big sort is this. The people of the United States are moving to live with people of like mind to such an extent that the number of landslide counties in the United States, now a landslide county is any county where one side or the other wins by 20 points or more, is at an all-time high and the percentage of Americans who are living in a landslide county Again, a place where one side wins by 20 ports or more is higher than it's ever been since we've been measuring the statistic. So what does this mean? What this means is that Americans tend to live and work alongside people of like mind. In some places, this is really extreme, this phenomenon. Okay, so you may not realize this. So you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard the statistic that Trump won 81% of white evangelical Protestants in the 2016 election. 81%. That's an overwhelming percentage. And Hillary didn't have the other 19. It was like 81 to maybe 15 or 16. I mean, it was overwhelming. Did you know that the island of Manhattan is less ideologically diverse than your average suburban megachurch. The island of Manhattan, did you know the city of San Francisco is less ideologically diverse than the white evangelical, evangelical Protestant church? Did you know the city limits of Washington DC are less diverse ideologically than white evangelical Protestant church? Each one of them voted for Hillary over Trump by a greater margin, sometimes reaching north of 90%. So what you end up having are people living, especially in progressive power structure, in the progressive power centers, in a, a, a position of ideological uniformity, the likes of which we haven't seen since we've been measuring this statistic. Most of the time when we look at that, and we look at that, and we think of that in terms of political coalitions. So to take the example of Pennsylvania, James Carville famously described Pennsylvania as Pittsburgh and Philadelphia with Alabama in between. Um, Pennsylvanians will often refer to that part as Pennsylvania. Um, so you've got Pittsburgh, and you've got Philadelphia, and you've got Alabama in between. And so there's this political calculus. Will the margin of votes that you build up in the exurban areas and the, in the, urb, in the rural areas counteract the mass number of votes that Democratic candidates will build up in the urban areas. And there's all these political calculuses, uh, cal calculi, whatever, you know what I'm saying. There's all these political calculations made about how do you build these coalitions and can the rural, when the rural returns come in, will they counter? You saw this in the battle of, the epic battle of, of Ted v. Beto. In the battle of Ted v. Beto, Beto's really outperforming Hillary and Harris County, but we haven't had the panhandle results coming in. You know, and so you're, you're, you look at it like this. Fewer people look at it from the standpoint of what is this doing to our culture? What is it doing to our culture when people of like mind gather and live together and work together and worship together or not worship together? What happens? What happens? 
Now, I know for a fact, if only three of you have played World of Warcraft, like eight of you know West Virginia v. Barnett, and three of you have read the Green New Deal, that nobody read this Cass Sunstein Harvard Law Review article from 1998 called The Law of Group Polarization. And if any of you did, you are my hero. But there was a, a, an obscure, you're my hero. Do you also play World of Warcraft? Oh, well, <laughs> there went that. Um, so Cass Sunstein writes an article in the late 1990s called The Law of Group Polarization. And it's one of the least read yet most important concepts. And if anything I do in my public life can at least be an ambassador for this idea that somebody else came up with, um, that nobody read, if I can make sure it's more widely read, then I've accomplished something with my life. Uh, and essentially what this means is that when people of like mind gather, the common expression of their shared belief gravitates to the extreme. What does this mean? Okay, I'm gonna pick on poor Denny again. So Denny and I go out to dinner. And Denny, like any red-blooded Kentuckian, is a strong advocate of the Second Amendment. And he and I are talking, and we're talking about our gun collections, we're talking about threats to gun rights from the Democrats, um, maybe we ha invite a third person into our group, and they're also a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, and we get maybe in a fourth person, and we're all having dinner, and we're just talking about those darn Democrats and what they want to do with gun control and how it's ineffective, and don't they know this chart, and don't they know this statistic, and come on. At the end of that dinner, are we gonna be more likely to be in agreement about uh, gun rights or less likely? Are we gonna be more enthused about gun rights or less enthused? You know the answer. You're gonna be more enthused. We're probably gonna get in our cars and race to a gun shop to buy our next AR-15 because we already have one, of course. Um, so it's just when people of like mind gather, they tend to be more enthusiastic about their underlying point of view. How many of you have left a really good Bible study and said, man, I love Jesus less. No, it doesn't happen. When you have a really good worship service, when you have a really good Bible study, when you're surrounded by people who reinforce your point of view and encourage you in pursuing that point of view, you tend to get more zealous. It's the way we are. It is the way we are. And what also Cass Sunstein found is we will tend to get so zealous that by the end of this process, he called group deliberation. In other words, when the group is thinking through an issue. By the end of the group deliberation, sometimes the whole group will end up more extreme than the most extreme individual was at the beginning of the deliberation. In other words, if you're sitting there and you're brainstorming the Green New Deal, maybe the most radical person said, we need to uh, be net zero carbon emissions in 10 years, and I don't know, I think we should also include some stuff about job guarantees. And then somebody else says, oh yeah, well why stop there? And you begin to have what is a cascade effect. And this cascade effect moves the whole group ever more extreme. When you understand this, you can't stop seeing it in our culture. You cannot stop seeing it, okay? So let's give some, some examples. Um, so five years ago, five years ago, if I said a man won the 1976 Olympic decathlon, male decathlon in 1976, uh, would that be a controversial statement? No, five years ago. So that's, for those of you keeping score, five years ago is, is 2014. Some of you may remember 2014. Um, it was, you know, every, it's, probably the youngest person here was 14 in 2014. So five years ago, if I'd made the assertion that a man won the 1976 Olympic decathlon, that would be a not controversial statement. Now, in 2019, there are entire communities where if I assert that a man won the 1976 Olympic decathlon, that's, an act, that's a bigoted statement because Caitlyn Jenner is and has always been a woman, okay? And that the Planned Parenthood tweet that men have a uterus, men have a uterus, men have a uterus, men have a uterus, 
It's just a statement of scientific fact, y'all. It's just science. And that if you are misgendering a person, you are committing an act of violence. Violence. To use the male pronoun to describe Caitlyn Jenner. Now, there might have been people who believed that in 2014. There were people who believed that in 2014. 2013, 2012. But the extent to which it is now impossible, say, for example, to write an article in the New York Times and to have the New York Times, if I'm referring to, say, Caitlyn Jenner in the New York Times, to use the male pronoun would be against the style guide of the Times because it's just not the case that Caitlyn Jenner is a man. He's just not a man. Okay, that's a really large change about a pretty fundamental issue about identity, about what, is, what does it mean to be male or female in a remarkably short period of time. A period of time, a fraction of the period of time it took from being uh, a Democrat passing the Defense of Marriage Act and signing a Defense of Marriage Act into law and the Obergefell decision. That was a thousand years compared to the amount of time it took uh, our culture to move on the issue of what it means to be a man or a woman in large sections of our culture. And so that is the law of group polarization in action. And it's not confined to these hot button issues of, of gender and sexuality. There's a lot of other issues, right and left, when you're talking about like-minded communities. So let's take another one. Let's take uh, um, on the right side of the spectrum. There are ideas that now are commonly accepted conventional argumentation and conventional wisdom in conservative America that 25 years ago were barely a blip at all on the radar screen. Uh, I'll take, let's look at the gun rights issue. Uh, I've been a pro Second Amendment guy forever, but if you had talked to me when I was in law school, in the uh, year 1991 AD that, um, you know, one of the biggest movements in um, gun rights is gonna be constitutional carry. I would have said, come again? What's that? Oh, that's the second amendment is your gun permit. Oh, I could buy into that, but no, I mean, come on. Our, we're, our nation will never, and now there are 14 states where constitutional carry is the law of the land. You have a situation where in 1986, you can actually look at charts. And I like to pick the year 1986 because uh, right around that time was the year of the first, uh, I believe it was uh, a set of uh, same-sex marriages in the, in, on the, in the National Mall in DC. So you have sort of the beginning of the same-sex marriage movement. In 1986, you have the, uh, the United States, if you looked at a map of the United States, virtually all of the country is either a no issue, uh, the states are no issue where they will not give you a handgun carry permit, or is a may issue where you have to sort of prove your, your need for one before you can have a handgun carry permit. And now you look at this, the map of the United States, it has flipped entirely. It has flipped entirely because gun rights assumed a great importance in the minds of one set of Americans and they were able to move the needle on it to a point where even if you looked at where the law is now compared to where it was in 1986, a conservative in 1986 would have said, you're insane. It is never getting there. It is never getting there. What are you talking about? And yet very rapidly, a cohesive community moved the dial very rapidly by historical standards. Look at another issue, Medicare for all. Medicare for all is an issue that even a decade ago, Bernie Sanders, this you know, grumpy socialist from Vermont, was all on his own on this, like completely on his own. He introduces Medicare for all, first time he introduced it, not a single co-sponsor, co not one. No co-sponsors. Now, each of the leading Democratic contenders for president has signed on to a version of that. Kamala Harris was on CNN saying, yep, private insurance, we gotta move past that. That's a really big move over a really big segment of our society and our culture in a short amount of time. And so what's ending up happening is this. 
Here is the stereotype we've always had of the American people. It's a U, right? So you have the big middle and you have the small extremes. Uh, if you, and that's been the case for a lot of years, but now if you look at the data, what's happening is the U is smushing. I mean, not the, it's a, yeah, it's upside down U. Um, that, that bell curve is smushing. So you have this bell curve, big middle, small extremes, and that bell curve is smushing towards the U. So where you have bigger groups of people on the edges and smaller and smaller group of people in the middle. That is the law of group polarization. That is when people of like mind gather, the common expression of their shared view gets more and more extreme. That means more people gallop towards the extremes. Now what drives that? We do still have a bell curve on one thing, and that's political engagement. Most people are not engaged politically. I mean, it's just a fact. You know, you could take the biggest Twitter account in politics. You could take Trump's. And he can tweet something controversial. But if you have Taylor Swift wakes up one morning and she tweets out, morning fans, love you, heart emoji, rainbow emoji, unicorn emoji, it will triple the tweets, retweets, likes, engagement of a Donald Trump tweet. Um, pop culture is still far dominant over political culture. The number of Americans who are in the real day-to-day -day basis are engaged in politics is pretty small. It's pretty small. Um, recent studies showed that a lot of American political engagement is being driven by the two edges, the super woke, about 8% of Americans, and then the what are called devoted conservatives, about 6% of Americans. And, but what's interesting is the people who are most devoted to politics, the people who care the most, tend to be the most extreme. And that's what's driving our discourse. That's what's giving this particular kind of view of intersectionality jet fuel. Because I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna tell you a truth about life. The people who care the most about an issue set the agenda for the issue, period. Why do you think before there's a superhero movie launch that all of these megawatt Hollywood stars will go to a comic book convention, okay? And sit there in front of a class, a, a, a room full of gigantic nerds. And I'm saying nothing against them because they're my people. But a room full of gigantic nerds and even field questions about why their costume contains one color scheme versus another color scheme that they've seen from the comics. And what was the artistic vision of like darkening Wonder Woman's costume? You know, why is it different from the 1970s? I mean, why do they subject themselves to that? Because they know the people who care the most set the agenda. Because if that appearance goes badly, that trailer doesn't look good, if someone doesn't like the com co costume, doesn't understand the artistic vision, they'll launch, they'll, they'll launch the first tweet into the Twitter sphere, they'll write the first article, they'll write the first comment, that launches more comments and more tweets and creates a zeitgeist and a feeling and an expectation. Like, why did I know the first, why did I know Green Lantern, Lan, Green Lantern was gonna be bad before I saw it? Because of my fellow nerds told me there were lots of signs of doom. And if you've not seen Green Lantern, the Ryan Reynolds Green Lantern, don't see it. It's not good, okay? And I guarantee you just because I said that and I care so much you're gonna be one night, like five years from now, somebody's gonna say, we should see that Green Lantern. And you're gonna say, no, we're gonna waste our time. Instead, you should see Aquaman. Aquaman is very solid, and don't let any conservative on Twitter dissuade you from seeing Aquaman. It is outstanding. Like, America's been needing a movie where sharks have lasers mounted on their heads. Um, but the people who care the most set the agenda in life. That's how it works. Some of you guys are future pastors. Some of you guys might be actual pastors. Do you know who is going to make your life wonderful or awful? It's going to be the people who care the most in your congregation. You know, there's that statement that 20% of a congregation does about 80% of the work. As a member of the 80% who does the 20% of the work, I can tell you that that's true. 
but it's a 20% of a congregation that defines the character and the culture and the, and the, and the day-to-day life of that congregation, of that school, of that company, you name it, you name it. Well, what does that 20% look like in American politics? It looks pretty darn white, pretty darn rich, and pretty darn obsessed. And it is obsessed on competing ends of the spectrum. On the, on the, on the super woke side, it tends to be moving pretty dramatically towards the vision of intersectionality that I outlined. Now, here's what's really interesting. Here's what's fascinating about that. If you're talking about the intersectionality concept, a white progressive is more likely to believe that race discrimination is the main material factor in holding back in any, any individual African American from achieving career success than an African American is. So there's greater zeal you often will see greater zeal amongst white progressives on key race issues than you see even in African-American Democrats. It's a fascinating dynamic. It's a fascinating reality. And so you will often see online, if God help you, you spend time on Twitter, which I have to because it's my job. Part of my job is to, to put ideas into the, into the bloodstream of the country Nobody hates white people more than white progressives. I mean to tell you, if you want to see a tweet that absolutely lacerates white people, 19 times out of 20, it's a white dude doing it. And part of this is this process of group polarization where through intersectionality and other identity group uh, concepts, which are often engineered and, and um, cultivated in very predominantly white elite academic circles, what you begin to see is a process where the people who are most engaged on this are driving the bus on this in a way that is, being, that is increasing that degree of separation. And it's increasing that and moving people towards an extreme. Um, and so that's one of the fascinating ironies of intersectionality is that contrary to a lot of popular beliefs, it is not actually, often, often it is not actually historically marginalized communities versus white, a white power structure. It is often a progressive white power structure against a conservative or traditional white power structure. A lot of what is happening in this country is something I wrote about called the Great White Civil War, where you are beginning to see a, a fundamental ideological change in America's uh, white community, a fundamental religious change in America's white community, and they are fighting it out, fighting it out. And that is something that a lot of people are missing about what's happening, and a lot of this is because of this group polarization. People of like mind are no longer living in the same, I mean, are no longer living around people who, who disagree with them. And when, but, and, and even, it doesn't even take that many dissenting voices to change this dynamic. It, sometimes it just takes one dissenting voice. So here's what happens when people of like mind gather and the common expression of shared views moves more to the extreme. Now, I know more of you have heard this term. What ends up happening is you move what is called the Overton window. Okay, who knows what the Overton window is? Okay, more, slightly more people. The Overton window is named after a guy. This is one of those concepts that's used so much in like political Twitter that when you even say the words, everyone rolls their eyes. But outside of political Twitter, nobody's heard of it, but it's really important. The Overton window is defined by, it's a concept created by a former um, director of the Mackinac Institute, a, a, conservative think tank in Michigan. And essentially the Overton window is the range of acceptable discourse. So uh, the Overton window is the set of ideas that are acceptable to be deba debated in society. And so therefore the real issue isn't did Re Republicans win or Democrats win, it's where is the Overton window. So if you can move the Overton window far enough to the right even if a Democrat wins, as far as a, if you're, say, a conservative, the outcome is going to still be preferable 
to where it was if a Republican won 15 years ago with the Overton window on the left. Okay, and let me give you a good example of how the Overton window shifts and changes in American politics. Bill Clinton, some of you are old enough to remember the Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton's two terms. The Overton window has shifted so much that many of the policy achievements of Bill Clinton's two terms would not be attainable by a Republican president, Republican House, and Republican Senate today. Okay? Think about it. Bill Clinton, one of his signature achievements was something called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, passed with overwhelming bipartisan majorities way back in the ancient 1990s. Uh, another signature legislation of Bill Clinton's White House is he signed into law, and I mentioned this last hour, the Defense of Marriage Act, defining man, uh, marriage as a man and a woman for purposes of federal law. This was the 1990s with a Democratic president, y'all. One of the signature legislative achievements of the Bill Clinton presidency was the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, along with a whole of host of other uh, criminal justice reforms that imposed draconian new punishments for crimes. Nobody's talking about that now. Nobody, the move now is prison reform. And then here's another thing. The, you know, this is a concept for those of you who are uh, 20 or younger have never heard of. You may not even know what these words mean. A budgetary surplus. Okay. There was an actual budgetary, there was so much, again, this is a concept that you guys probably have never heard of. And some of you will just have to dust the co cobwebs off in your brain. There was enough fiscal discipline, what? to create a budgetary surplus in the United States of America. You talk about moving the Overton window. There is no such thing as that anymore in American politics. So if you look at, you know, now I know Bill Clinton nominated and confirmed a bunch of progressive justices, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and others, uh, Stephen Breyer. But if you took the Bill Clinton platform and pasted it onto the Republican Party today, there would be people in the Republican Party who would say that's too conservative. That's too conservative. That's the Overton window, guys. That's when you move the range of acceptable discourse, you can move the culture even when you lose any given political fight. Even when you lose any given political fight. And so what ends up happening is that we have a law of group polarization empowered by an idea, uh, by the big sort, combined with an inter, uh, intersectionality that is moving rapidly the Overton window. But here's where it gets really complicated. Because of the big sort, we don't have necessarily one Overton window anymore. You end up having two Overton windows to the point where we have difficulty interacting and and discuss, we have difficulty speaking to each other anymore. I'll give you a perfect example. Let's go back to, we're not shying away from hot button topics here. Let's go back to um, the um, trans uh, transgender issue. So I was at a gathering recently with a bunch of people on the left and on the right who are very, very concerned about American polarization. These are great people. Great people on the left and on the right. Some of the finest people I've ever met very deeply concerned about where America's going, um, some of the finest progressive minds in the United States, some of the finest conservative minds in the United States. I mean, these are people that I, I just love them to death. Um, gotten to know them as a result of a lot, you know, one of the silver linings of the dark cloud of American polarization is that sometimes you, there are a, a small group of people who are really concerned about this and are reaching across party aisles in ways that they never would have before. And you get to meet, and I've gotten to meet people who have very different religious views from me, they have very different political views from me, but they're just lovely people, love them to death. Um, and we're having this conversation, you know how it is when you get a group that's kind of interesting and unique and quirky and you all get to really get along, inevitably it's gonna turn into this. Why are we just so much better than everybody else? Not really, but it's like, why can we have a discourse that nobody else can have? What is it about us? that allows us to have a conversation that nobody else can have. And, and 
I just, you know, every now and then I, I have this, one of my callings in life is to just be the stink bomb at the party. And I just said, can we though? Or have we just decided not to talk about certain issues? Is that one of the, is one of the foundations of our unity is that we've just decided to table some things? And they go, no, there's, oh, we can talk about anything. I mean, we're fine. I said, okay, is Caitlyn Jenner a man? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, silence, silence. We look at each other, who's gonna go first? Who's gonna go first? And then we're like, yeah, let's table that issue. Let's preserve the unity of the group and table that issue. Um, that's the two Overton windows. If you, there is a, and, and parts of, certainly conservative and more traditional uh, America, if you say, Caitlyn Jenner is a woman, you have signaled that you are no longer, in very, very many fundamental ways, a part of this tribe anymore. You are outside the bounds of acceptable discourse. And then conversely, if you, you know, if I go to Brooklyn and I'm casually talking about Caitlyn Jenner and I use a male pronoun, I mean, the barista may pour the coffee on my head. Um, it's outside the bounds of acceptable, acceptable discourse. So we are polarizing, we're polarizing so much that the boundaries of acceptable discourse are pulling apart. And there's real data to support this. So, for example, if you talk to, there's surveys of, um, let's remember the previous lecture, I said that a lot of censorship is coming from the grassroots up. If you talk to college students today and you ask them, do you support free speech? Overwhelmingly, yes. Absolutely overwhelmingly, yes. Well, do you believe free speech, I mean, hate speech should be protected? Uh, huge numbers, no. So I support free speech, but I'm against protecting hate speech. Now, let's just be clear, as a matter of law, there's no such thing as hate speech. So as a matter of constitutional law, there's no such concept of hate speech that has lesser constitutional protection. It's a fiction. Legal, it's a legal fiction. I'm not saying there aren't actually hateful speech. There, aren't, there isn't actually hateful speech. But I'm saying as a legal concept, hate speech is a fiction, okay? But now let's talk just amongst us folks. Hate speech is a concept that a lot of people feel like they understand what it is. And so you say, well, Free speech should be protected, yes, but not hate speech, no. So then all of a sudden, support for suppressing hate speech begins to rise, rise, rise. And then you say, well, what is hate speech? Well, one of the most viable definitions of it that gathers uh, some of the most support is essentially that says any speech that offends a person on the basis of a protected characteristic. Whoa, wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> so. Let's bring back the dots to intersectionality. What are, remember about what I said about experiential authority? Okay, so if you have experiential authority, then everyone on my side falls into line and allies with me. So then who defines who should be, who defines who should be offended? The person with the experiential authority. What's my responsibility? It's not to say, you know, in spite of your offense, you should dialogue back rather than censor. The person with the experiential authority has the authority to define the response. That's what authority means. They have the power to define the response. And so what ends up happening is you begin to have a situation where people who are offended by speech, the group or the entity or the activists who are offended by speech, not only get to define what is out of bounds, but then define the response. And when you see this, what, this is what's happening on college campuses time and time and time again. And when you combine that with the law of group polarization and people moving further and further away from each other, they're going to be offended by more and more stuff. More and more things will make people angry, even if there's no intent at all. You know, it's one of the most important, Rorschach, I've never been able to say that. You know, it's the pictures where Rorschach, never been able to say that very well. Rorschach test, one of the most interesting Rorschach tests in modern, in the last five years, was the image of the teenage kid from Covington Catholic staring at Nathan Phillips, the Native American elder who was banging the drum in his face. There was just a still photo taken. 
And the absolute certainty, the certainty with which people looked at that look on the kid's face and decided it was offensive and wrong was stunning to anybody who hasn't been paying attention, okay? Because what ended up happening, and this is the dynamic you see time and time again online, is as soon as an incident arises, the first and loudest voice possessing the experiential authority or, seeking, or purporting to speak on behalf of a group of the experiential authority defines the response instantly, and that is the response. And so what you have is a dynamic not unlike a sheepdog and a herd mentality. And you see this on MAGA Twitter all the time. So I'm not just picking on the left here. You see this on MAGA Twitter constantly. Um, is the first person to speak with the authority to speak sets the tone, everyone else follows. Because that's your obligation through allyship. My obligation is to ally. But if what is offensive is being increasingly defined by the law of group polarization, what's acceptable discourse is being defined by this moving Overton window, the recipe for conflict is almost endless. I mean, any given day, any given day you can come up with and you can spot a contemporary example. So just recently, Esquire magazine did a series, starting a series like looking at American youth, and the first guy they picked out to look at was a relatively Trump-friendly 17-year-old white guy. Outrage. Outrage. Haven't even seen the rest of the series yet. Haven't seen it. But the fact that they chose this guy first was an outrage, just an outrage. And so that's the dynamic we're beginning to, to get. It's not, you cannot look at intersectionality, you cannot look at identity politics as this thing that exists separate and apart from and uninfluenced by everything else in American culture, including this big sort, as we move and we live with like-minded people. And so what ends up happening is that we agree with each other, and not only can we not conceive of rational disagreement, we cannot hear it, or we refuse to hear it. And so therefore, don't even really have an opportunity to exercise tolerance. You don't even have an opportunity to exercise forgiveness because everything is seen through the lens of malice and everything is seen through the lens of oppression and everything is, is uh, this is, uh, everything is, a, is a, cat a catastrophe. And so it is really amazing to me, well, it's, not, it's, it's amazing to someone if you transplanted them from 25 years ago and you took them and you planted them on the National Mall in Washington and saw that confrontation between the Hebrew Israelites, Nathan Phillips, and the Covington Catholic kids from 25 years ago, you would look at that and go, oh, that's all kind of weird. Okay, where's the bus? No big deal. Now in an age of hyperpolarization, identity politics, intersectionality, what you created was the perfect storm for five days of rage. Five days of rage. Where very few people at the end of the five days, even though greater video evidence emerged, even though there was more nuance in all kinds of different ways, very few people budged from one end to the other on that. Why? Why? Because to move from one end to the other on that is to move outside your Overton window. It's to move outside the group that is polarizing. It's to defy, perhaps, your tribe. And that, that casts you out of your church. And that's one of the fundamental challenges that we're facing in the United States right now. And so let's have some questions, and then after lunch, we'll talk about what can Christians do about this.